Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am an alcoholic. My name's Connie. And I am sober today, and anything after that's a bonus for this alcoholic. I've never been at such a large, closed women's meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's great. And I'd like to thank the committee for asking me to come and share tonight, and Robin, my convention buddy for the weekend. Um, I, I phoned my partner to say goodnight last night, and he said, uh, well, I'm going to come down there and drag and hang around the back and keep you honest. And uh, I don't see him in the UK. I've been looking back there. I wouldn't put it past him. You know, the very first time I came here to a roundup, I was a couple months sober. And somebody had given me an orange pinto, and it had been rear-ended, so it was, the back end was all squashed in. And the passenger's side was wired shut, so we all had to get in the driver's side. And there were seven of us coming down here. Nobody had any money. And we had to bring all our gear with us, and we were all going to share a room. So we took out the back seat, and that way we could all pile in and get down here. And uh, on the back there was a bumper sticker that said, I'm a friend of Bill W.'s. <laughs> And yesterday I came in and, and um, the committee got me a lovely room and, you know, I was saying to Vicki, not much has changed. I, I, I walked in, it was a beautiful view and, and I looked outside and then and there was a jar of candies beside the bed and I went far out candies and put down my stuff and came down to the roundup, you know. So I just really like it and, and those stories coming to roundups, that's what kept me sober at the beginning because I didn't have a program. But I had the fellowship, and I used the fellowship till it hurt. But it did keep me sober for a while. If you're a newcomer here tonight, I'd like to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not an authority. We do have one. It is a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a drunk, and God help me if I ever forget it. But I'd like to mention something else to the newcomer because I don't think we talk about it enough. We here in Alcoholics Anonymous suggest that you don't drink. But if you're still drinking, keep coming back anyway. It's a program for drunks, and we don't talk about that enough. And just because you drink, it isn't enough, it isn't good enough reason to stay away. Keep coming, coming and something will happen for you, like it happened for me. And this countdown tonight was overwhelming, and I'd like to address the old timers here tonight. Because you told me, if you want what we have, then do what we do. And if you don't want what we have, well don't worry about it. Connie, do whatever you want. And I did that for a while, too. And, and you told me, treat AA like a box. And if you hang on the top, you'll fall off. And if you hang around the edges, you'll never get in. But if you stay inside Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to be okay. And coming here to share with you tonight is part of the way I stay inside Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, if the old-timers don't come back, who's going to show me how to live? Because you see, it happens at every roundup, and I'm surprised at this one, but there's big gaps here. Where'd they all go? You know, they're not all dead. <laughs> and their life can't be all that great. And, and I want to stay inside because it's the only chance I've got. When I was four years old, 
I would go downstairs in the laundry room and watch my mom do the washing on a ringer washer, and we had only one rule down there. Do not put your hand in the ringer washer. <laughs> and she told me why. She said, if you do, it'll break your arm and it'll hurt. One day, she looked away. I don't know, something compulsive and impulsive jumped out. I put my hand in the ringer washer, and she was right. It broke my arm, and it hurt. <laughs> and when I was 11 years old, four of us girls got together, absentee mom, permissive father, and we got a six-pack of beer. And we had a pajama party, and we cracked open the case, and we each had one. Now, I don't know if you can identify with this, but I had a problem right away. I wanted to know who was going to get the other two. <laughs> and about that time, a little boy down the street had died from sniffing glue. And I read that in the newspaper, and, and it was all around the school. And myself and my friend Mary Sue ran out, and we bought some glue. And we sniff glue. And you see, for the next 25 years, not much changed for me. It was a compulsive and impulsive behavior, and it was looking for that high all the time, and there was never enough. And nothing changed from the first time I took a drink to the last time I took a drink. I was born in an alcoholic home, and that's not why I'm alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because I seem to have been born that way. I'm in the big book. Men and women drink essentially because they like the feeling it produces. And you work, wake up with a feeling of remorse and guilt and a firm resolve not to do it again, and then I do it again. And I drank because I liked it. But I remember I carried some pain into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I remember lying in bed when I was very young, my parents fighting. My mom crying and my dad raging and, you know, there'd be food on the walls and there would be broken, busted furniture and, and I'd hear the smack in the flesh out there and I'd, I'd lie in bed and I'd think, you know, I'd pray to God that uh, they just take the bad part of, out of my dad and leave the good part because I love them and I couldn't figure that out. And in the morning I'd get up and the house looked like World War Three. And we weren't allowed to say anything. And we'd be stepping over broken furniture, and you'd still see the dried food dripping down the walls. But we weren't allowed to say anything. And my mom would just say, well, it's okay. Best pre on you've ever seen in your life still is. It's all okay. Didn't really happen. And uh, there was a lot of pain that went on in that home, and, and a lot of rampaging, and a lot of fear. And... Uh, you know, I remember one time my dad came home, and I'd been playing in a trunk that I was not allowed to play in, and I knew that. And he caught me in the trunk, and he told me, you put your hands back up in that trunk, and he lifted the lid. And he was drunk, and he slammed down the lid. And he, before he did that, he looked at me and he said, you've been playing in the trunk, and I said, and he said, look at me, and tell the truth. And so I looked at him and I said, yeah, I... I was playing in the trunk, and he slammed down the lid. And he broke my fingers, several of them. And I went to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, my mom says, well, you can't tell anybody, because if you do, they'll pull us apart. And so when people at the hospital asked me what happened, I said, I did it myself. And I looked them in the eye, and I told a lie. And, you know, I can still look you in the eye today to tell a lie. It's a wand. And in those days, my dad would always disappear when the rent was due. My mom was busy holding us together and telling us nothing was wrong. And when they evicted you for non-payment of rent, they took everything. And I remember more than once my toy box going down the street in the back of somebody's truck. And I would feel so angry. And I'm in Freedom from Bondage itself, where it says, I was a person who never did react normally to an emotional situation because I was, wasn't really angry. I was hurt. But that became an appropriate response for me and something that I have to check myself on today. When you hurt me, 
I'd rather get angry and tell you how I really feel. My father wanted a boy. I was the middle of three girls, and he made it clear I wasn't a boy. And he was disappointed, and I tried hard. And all I ever wanted was his love and approval. And I was angry for a long time that I wasn't a boy, until well after I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that I could accept that I was a woman, and that was okay. I liked being that way. And... uh <laughs> I reached a reconciliation with my dad. Yeah, I wanted his love and approval, and I may never get it, but it's okay today. It's really okay. But the pain got so great that I went out in the streets. I ran away, and I ran away over a couple years, 13, 14, and around 15 years old, they stopped looking for me. And I was hungry and afraid at the beginning, you know, but pretty soon I loved it. I fit in, and I was validated. We needed each other. And there were crash houses, and there were soup lines, and, and, and we begged for money, and of course there was the drugs and alcohol that was bound to happen. Well, it's a cheap wine, but you know, it was one of my fondest periods that I remember in my life, because there was such a, such a sense of belonging. We all needed each other to stay alive. And I found a job out in the street, and uh, it was running dope. And I lived in the prairies then. And I was 16 years old, and a man offered me money to run dope from the prairies to the coast. And that was my first job, and the only rule was, <laughs> and the only rule was you can't do any while you're working. And uh, a few times I got in trouble with that, but, uh, you know, I'd run between the prairies and the coast, and occasionally I'd phone home, and... You know, my mom tried hard, and she would always say, uh, when are you coming home? And, and I'd say, gee, I don't know, Mom, uh, I'm busy. Uh, I never told her what I was doing, and you want to move back home? No, I don't. Well, will you come home for Christmas? Yeah, Mom, I'll show up for Christmas. And uh, I think about that because there were all the times I did show up for Christmas, and I was so loaded I didn't even know I was there. And then there were all the times I didn't show up, and I hurt them just as much. But on occasion, I'd check in with mom, with mom, with mom, and uh, she's always telling me, you should do something about your life, honey, you should do something about your life. So I did. I got pregnant. <laughs> and I had a baby boy. And my thinking was then, well, this will be somebody that will love me forever. This will be somebody that will never fail me, and this will be something that I can own. And I took the baby hostage while he was still in the womb. And after he came out, I continued running dope. And uh, occasionally I'd phone home. And eventually the heat was on, and I moved to the coast. And at one time my parents made a move to take the baby away. And I won that round. And I began to play the game with them. Maybe you can see them, and maybe you can't. And that became my power. <clears throat> well, I was 20 years old. I was on the coast, and I thought, okay, I'm going to make a fresh start. So I found another man. And uh, I had a baby girl. And uh, we got into drugs again for a while, and I was willing and dealing the drugs. And, you know, one day... He said, this is screwing up my life, and I'm going to quit. And he did. And I said, this is, going to, this is screwing up my life, too, so I'm going to quit. And I couldn't. And all along there was the booze, and needless to say, that relationship ended. And there was another custody battle. And I did, wanted the kids, and I didn't want the kids, and they were in my way, but I loved them, and, you know, all that stuff went on in my mind, and, and I got a better lawyer with my drug money. <laughs> and I won the custody suit, and I kept the kids for spite, and I began to play the game with him. Maybe you can see your kids, and maybe you can't. Depends on how I'm feeling. So now I'm 26, and I got two kids, and... uh I never wanted the responsibility. 
And there was insanity in that home, and I need to tell you about that. Because I was drinking a lot by then and doing anything else that you get my hands on that might work for me, that might change the way I felt just for a little while. My house was spotless. My kids went to school, and they did well. And God helped them if they didn't, because that was my mask. But that's not what was really going on. We went from uh, six-course meals, macaroni and cheese, depending on uh, how business was. Sometimes I'd leave for the bar at four, and I wouldn't come back till whenever. Sometimes I'd have blackouts, and sometimes I'd have grayouts. I remember coming home sometimes and hauling out those kids out of bed at 1 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't remember where I'd stashed my drug money. They'd be running around looking for money. I always remember my little girl saying, what does $1,000 look like, Mom? What does it look like? She was about four then. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd remember that she'd paged me at the bar at 7 o'clock that night and said, when are you coming home, Mom? And I'd say, what's the matter? Are you lonely? And she'd say, yeah. And I'd say, no, you're not. You'll be okay. Go play with your toy. Go watch TV. I'll be home when I get there. And that's the way it was. And the blackouts were merciful because I didn't remember but the gray outs, boy, they were really punishing. Because I did remember at least part of it. And I always, you know, what do I tell my kids? Do I tell them I feel like a world prime failure? Do I feel them, tell them that I only want to be responsible for myself? And only in a limited way at that. Do I tell them that Having all the answers is making me crazy, and being responsible for them is making me bitter. Do I tell them that I'm dragged down, and I'm just drowning in so much booze that I don't know which way to go anymore? And I'm selfish, and I'm tired, and I'm bored with a day after day of it, because about then I couldn't remember a day that I didn't feel tired anymore. And if I told them all that, could I still tell them I love them? and that I never wished that they weren't born. And I never wished they were gone. And that sometimes I'd look at that in the gray outs, and my heart would just burst with pride and love, what I could muster up. And I remember the fear, and I want to tell them, that some of the moments I spent with them, with them were the most splendid moments I'd ever spent in my life. And that being with them, I felt more like a woman than ever lying underneath any man. And if I told them all that, could they still figure me out and know that I love them? And I was just in a horrible, horrible conflict all the time. And the pain got too great for my son, and he left at 15, like mother, like son. Now I'm one child, and I'm 26 years old, and I fell in with a group of longshoremen. <clears throat> and I started boosting hot goods and fronting hot goods and fencing hot goods, and and then I fell into a little credit card racket, and first I started with my credit card, and then I started with your credit card, and then I started with anybody's credit card, and uh, a little forgery came into play there. And I got turned on to booze cans, and for those of you who don't know what booze cans are, they're after-hour gambling joints out in the valley. This one was in particular. And there was the front where everybody gambled, and there was the back where everybody gambled and drinking at the front, and drugs and drinking at the back. And of course, I was in the back. And uh, one day, only special people got in the back. And one day, the man with the three-piece suit 
talked somebody into letting him in the back. So he came in the back, and then he talked somebody into hitting him up with a dose of narcotics. And somebody did that. And I was sitting there, and I was straight and I was sober, and I knew it was wrong. And I watched him put a needle in his arm, and I watched that man drop to the floor. They say he was dead before he hit the floor, but I'll never know, because I stepped over his body, and I walked out of the room just like everybody else, because I was afraid. And that wasn't a bottom for me, but I'll tell you, the question started. And I began to see some compromises. And they were really basic. But one time, I knew what it was like to be a fan. And one time, Christ, I knew what it was like, what it was about to help somebody. Especially help somebody that was dying. And I walked out because I was afraid. Shortly after that, I ran, ran head on into an officer in my hometown <clears throat> and uh, put him in the hospital for a few months. And I was up in some charges there. It was kind of closing in on me. One night, I, uh, I uh, hit a parked car in front of the bar and uh, I got out <clears throat> and I started yelling. And... Uh, there was no one there because it was parked. And I could see the police lights coming down the street, and I thought, now here's false pride for you. I pulled my brush out of my purse and started combing my hair. <laughs> now, it's really hard to look good in those situations, but, but somehow it was important that my hair be tidy as they were coming down the street, and I was going to go to jail. And, you know... I was two years sober before I remembered that my first AA meeting was in jail and not in White Rock. It was gone. And I didn't remember that until I was two years sober. Well, it seems like I was always trying not to hurt me and there was one more attempt, you know, always one more attempt and one more failure and that was me and this time I thought, okay, I'm going to knock off the drugs. It's a drug. And, uh, so I started going out <clears throat> with a fella, businessman in a suit, new image for me. I didn't know alcoholics came in suits. I, <laughs> like, I kept picking my disease. It didn't really matter. I just didn't know they came in suits. Well, that relationship was falling apart, and so home to mom, I went. <clears throat> I hadn't seen my parents for about four years at this time. We had a big family gathering. You haven't lived. You've been to one of my family gatherings. <clears throat> and uh, I got drunk and I blacked out. And I remember kicking out the picket fence and screaming up at the sky. I don't know what it was all about. It doesn't really matter. It was about being drunk. And my own mother called the police. So I came back to the coast. And it was their fault. And I was angry. I only had four months left to go, but I didn't know it at the time. But I needed to, I got some tranquilizers. And, uh, things were pretty quiet. <laughs> really quiet. But about that time, I got charged with 35 counts of credit card forgery from Visa for $35,000. And uh, I got charged with the driving charges with the police. And the terror, you know, of loneliness, and I had no tolerance for pain. And I couldn't remember a day when I just didn't feel tired anymore. You know, I thought you had to be drunk to be an alcoholic. I didn't know I was an alcoholic even though I wasn't drinking. And that was what fooled me for a while. But I'd reach that alcoholic dilemma. If I have one more drink, it's going to kill me. But if I don't have a drink, I'm going to die. And I'll never forget it. 
I'll never forget the wind blowing through my gut. God help me if I ever forget it. That terror and that loneliness and that self-hatred and all I wanted was another drink. So I called AA. <clears throat> and it's interesting because I'd had lots of worse days than that. The day I called AA, nothing had happened. I'd blacked out the night before. I'd done my puking for the morning. And because that's what happened, by then my stomach was going too. I was bleeding from the esophagus. And uh, my, my esophagus wasn't ruptured. It was just strained from puking. And, and uh, I can think of lots of worse days I had. But that's the day I called. And uh, I know one thing, and I'm sure of this, I think a man can feel like a man for a lot longer with a drinking problem than a woman. A woman with a drinking problem feels less than a woman almost right away. That's how it was for me. Well, I came to you with 34 counts of fraudery. Uh, for 34 counts of fraud and forgery, a tremendous amount of guilt because of that officer. And uh, it was a fear in my kid's eyes that really did it to me. The fear just wouldn't go away, that picture. And I called AA, and a lady phoned. The, the lady answered, and she said, will you be all right till tonight? And I said, well, yeah. I was trying to sound cool. And <laughs> she said, okay, I'll come and pick you up tonight. And I got off the phone, and I took a value. And I thought right away, God, Connie, you've really overreacted. You know? <laughs> now you've got some woman from AA coming to pick you up for a meeting. And, uh, you know, I was afraid. I mean, I, I, I thought, well, you probably don't want me to drink. And... Like, I didn't want to be here. I wanted to call it off. But I stood four doors down from where I really lived, and she picked me up that night in the pouring rain. And, and I went to that meeting. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that only an old-timer can share. You know, this old-timer looked over at me, and he said, If you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. <laughs> and, and I thought, No shit. You know, just, you know, but but if you ask me why I came today, I guess I have two answers. I'd lost my self-respect, and I couldn't take the fear in my kid's eyes anymore. I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't look at it anymore. And and you know, the disease is the same, and the solution's the same. But I think for a woman, the recovery is a little different. We come in here, and for the most part, especially those of us with families, we're on the lower end of the earning scale. We got the kids, and we're looking at their faces every bloody day. We can't afford the babysitter to go to meeting after meeting after meeting. And if we can get to meetings, we can't afford to go to restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. And we got to get to work right away because we can't work the fellowship for too long here. You know, the answers are still the same, but it's different. It was different out there. I was a slut, a whore, and a tramp for doing the same things they did. I was a bar star. And I think it's different in here. Our problems are just a little different. I love the men in AA. And I got a history to prove it. But <laughs> So I went to meetings and I fell in love with a coffee pot once a week, you know that. Thirteen set was my favorite one and I got a sponsor. And I got busy and I made sure that everybody was okay. I made sure the coffee pot was on. I made sure the meeting was organized. I made sure of this, I made sure of that, and I took care of you. And uh Lots of activity, but no action. Like I had just enough information to be dangerous, and, and I worked on the principle of take my advice because I'm not using it anyway. And, and, uh, <laughs> it's true. 
and and uh, you know, I remember a roundup that I chaired, and I was had an eloquent speech planned, and I was thanking you for coming, and this person for coming, and that person for coming, and it was all wonderful that you came, and thank you, my committee, and my little girl was sitting in the front row, and she's about 11 years old, and I didn't thank her. And it was the first time I'd ever seen pride in her eyes, a few years into sobriety, and I missed it. I didn't thank her for all the time I'd stolen from her while I was on the phone, making sure the roundup was okay. You know, I didn't thank her for all the times I cheated, uh, you know, times at meetings and all the rest. And this isn't why she left, but she left home. And she went and moved nine blocks away and lived with her father, and she was um, 12 years old. And the reason she left is because I wasn't bringing the program home. I had brought the disease home for oh so long, and I wasn't bringing my recovery home. And I didn't know it. And what happened <coughs> is I had to get a new sponsor. And I got a big book thumper. And uh, I think sponsorship isn't talked about enough. <coughs> And I want to go back to the countdown just for a minute. Probably half of this room here tonight was five years sober or under, maybe eight years sober or under. And uh, I'd like to know where they're all gone. One more time. You see, one thing about my sponsor is I looked in her eyes and I liked what I saw, but I also saw how she lived. But my sponsor has a sponsor. If your sponsor don't ask, have a sponsor, ask her how come. And my sponsor's come in 20 years sober, I think. I always get that wrong. And her sponsor's taking a 45-year cake next week. Dorothy T., she will be taking a cake at Thunder Ray's next Friday. And uh, that's what it's all about. They go to meetings, and they get their information and their advice from the big book. They don't have a whole lot of opinions on anything else. And whether I talk to Dorothy, her sponsor, or whether I talk to Audrey, my sponsor, they pretty well got the same answer. Because their answers come from the big book. They don't sit around and think them up. <laughs> I know, I'm sure Audrey thinks up some. Okay. But she led me through the steps. And she told me something that I didn't know. She said, first will come your family life, um, first will come your sobriety, and then will come your family life. And then will come your job and how you support that family. And fourth will come your social life. Oh, and I, I had them all out of order, and I didn't know it. <laughs> and, and basically she told me this, and this is around three years sober. She said, if you do what you've always done, you'll feel like you always felt. And if you feel like you always felt, you'll think what you always thought. And if you think what you always thought, you'll get what you always got, Connie. Because no change is just that. It's no change. So, she also told me today, guarantee sobriety. And a fighting chance at anything else. But are you willing to take the chance? And so... The big book says, I become convinced of step one and two. I don't take them. I just become convinced because after step two, it says, being convinced, we're at step three. My sponsor told me that. <laughs> and so I became convinced that I was an alcoholic. And, and I became convinced that there was a higher power when at two years sober, I walked out of court when I was looking at four years hard time because a handwriting expert didn't come up from New York, and the judge threw it out. And I thought, maybe. <laughs> but you see, I was talking about God, and I wasn't using God. Yuck, 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 all the time I was talking about God. And I was looking for all the big deals that I thought should be happening, and I wasn't paying attention to the little deals that were happening around me all the time. 
And I was practicing the principles inside the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I couldn't practice them outside because I was still relying on outside stuff to fix me and hold me together instead of a loving God, as I understand them. But I didn't know that till I got a sponsor who taught me what was in the book. And she tells me, read the black parts. And she knows the book. <laughs> and so I took step three and I took it on my knees with her. But you see, I used to think that step three was a forever thing. And it, it is, but it isn't because I make the decision once. It's a one-shot deal. And the rest of step three, turning my will and my life over the care of God, over to his care, I do in step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I don't ever have to get the rest of that right as long as I continue to work the steps. Something will happen. I didn't know that. So she just told me to pay attention. And, you know, I heard this little story, and I'll pass it on. There was a man in a canoe, and he was drowning. And some people came by in a canoe, and they said, jump in, we'll save you. And he said, no, no, I'm waiting for God to save me. And uh, so they said, fine, and, and the man kept drowning, and another canoe came by and said, jump in. And he said, no, 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 I'm waiting for God to save me. And they said, fine, and they drove on, and the guy drowned. And right before he was going down, he said, God, you know, why didn't you help me? And he said, I did. I sent you four people. <laughs> and you know, through that step three, I learned that if God doesn't come himself, he always sends somebody else. And it was all of you, but I wasn't paying attention. My sponsor got my attention. And you know, step four and five, I got the three S's in order. You know, um, sobriety, security, and sex. And I don't mind step four and fives, and and I try and do one once a year, and I'm not always real successful, but I try hard. And and I used to be afraid, just like everybody else here. They're always afraid, but you know we have this wonderful old timer in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, named Steve Corrigal, and I heard this, and it changed my attitude. He said he's got a sponsor that's. They're both in their 40s, and one had 10 days when the other one came in. And uh, so they had to use the big book. And C says, I didn't know step four was hard until somebody told me. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's right, you know. And so you get into meetings, and you hear stuff, and you hear it's hard, and you think, well, okay, then it's hard. And... and it isn't that hard, and I've learned to use that four-column inventory in a big book, and my sponsor says, do the 12 and 12 through, you know, read step four and five in there, because it was written 14 years later, after the big book, and it was written because they knew more. Oh, so, use the 12 and 12. And I always had a friend who's dead now who said, I'll always be on sixes and sevens, and I understand that now. My God needs me to experience imperfection because my God, as I understand him, is a loving and perfect God. I build the mountains. He moves the mountains. Sometimes he makes me move them, shovel at a time. But I don't mind those sixes and sevens. And one more time in the big book, two tiny little paragraphs in the 12 by 12, two whole chapters because they knew more. In eights and nines, you know, I stay as thick as my secrets. Principles under their maximum service to God and to my fellow man. And uh, <clears throat> I was ready. When I first came in, I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's all I ever did. But after the six and sevens, I knew I was ready to take care of some of those eights and nines. And uh, step 10 is is something that I don't always do. I know we're supposed to, but I don't always get there. Sometimes fall asleep first, you know. But there's another way to do step 10, and that's a spot check inventory. And I have a little plaque on my TV at home, and it says, If God seems far away, who moved? 
And the answer is always the same. It's me. And whenever there's a troubled spot in my day, I usually move to the other side of the room. And step 11 is uh, the whole program for me. And if I don't do it in the morning and at night, it's hard to practice the other steps in any way, shape, or form. I believe this whole program's about me, got me and my God as I understand them. But don't tell the newcomers that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you see, because sometimes, and you know, I think I ask God, you know, when things are tough, I say, "Why me?" And you know, what my sponsor says, "Then who, Connie? Who do you want it to be? You pick." You know, and uh, if I have to ask him why all the hard stuff, then I have to ask him why all the good stuff. Fair is fair. And uh, when I pray and meditate, something always happens. It's not always salvation, but something always happens. And step 12 is another promise for me. And that's just that I will have the spiritual awakening. And one more time, the old timer said to me, I will have a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And there was one old guy that always used to say, what steps? The other 11, you didn't work? And it's a promise to me that if I do the other 11 in order, not cafeteria style, I'll have a spiritual awakening. Back the book says spiritual awakening. It's just going to change. A whole bunch of things about me change, especially my attitude and my thinking. And uh, it's not my job to change. It's my job to take the steps. And the changes will come. I kept thinking, i got to change. i got to change. i got to change. But I just have to take the steps. And the steps change me. And that's it. Well, I need to tell you how it is, because I think we do each other a great disservice. And I certainly lose out if I don't tell you who I am. And it's not great some days. My daughter moved home in January 1992. She'd been on the streets for a while. And we started arguing almost right away. She's 17 and uh, almost 18. And she only lasted a couple months. And uh, we are always fighting. And, and I was fighting over cleaning the room and this and that. And my sponsor was always telling me... Uh, why don't you just close the door? And I missed that. I missed it. She said at every conversation, why don't you just close the door? And I missed it. And uh, another missed opportunity. And so she ended up back out in the streets, and that didn't work. So July 1992, the other one phones my son. And he says, uh, Mom, I don't want to live anymore. I want to kill myself. I'm just like you. Why didn't you tell me? And I said, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you, Dad, because you wouldn't have listened. And you see, that son of mine, I've watched him since he's 17 years old till the time he was 24 go in and out of AA. When his girlfriend got mad, whatever girlfriend, he'd come for a meeting when the heat was off his feet. And he only ever stayed for one. Last July, he didn't want to live anymore, and I said, the only thing that I know, and the only, you know, something that he taught me, do you want to go to a meeting? And he said, yeah. So I stepped way back, and my partner Brian took him to a meeting. And he moved in, and he came in the house, and he's almost six feet tall, and weighed about 100 pounds. And uh, he had a little bag from the food bank with a jet jar of peanut butter in it. And uh, he got to work, and he went to meetings. And, uh, you know, we never had an argument the whole time he was there. Well, that's a lie. We had one. And, and he was there for 66 days. And guess what happened? Between one kid and the other kid, I learned how to close the door. <laughs> that's it. It's it's amazing. And uh, 
Brian took him to meetings, and everybody took him to meetings, and he was doing really well, and, and 66 days sober, he went off to live on his own. But before he left, he came in the house, and he shook hands with Brian, and he gave me a hug, and he said, thanks for letting me come home. And I had never been able to offer him much, and I knew that time that he'd come home. It's not a happy ending. As far as I know, he still hasn't drank today, but he's found out a reason, uh, a way not to. He's back in the crack. And um, you know what? If I got a higher power, he's got one too. And God loves him more than me. And it's tough as hell some days to watch your kid. I don't know what it is about kids. Maybe I do, but go through the stuff they do. And it's hard to treat them like a newcomer. And I've chosen not to watch too closely this time because it hurts too much. Uh, I don't avoid it, but I don't go looking for it because I can't handle it. There's one thing I know. He's in our big book. He's in AA sitting there with a head full of whatever, crack cocaine, body full of crack cocaine, you know, that sort of thing of a head full of AA and a belly full of whatever. And uh, he'll be back or he'll kill himself. One of the two. I mean, I didn't get here till I was 34. And uh, I don't know. I guess you learn what you learn when you learn it. And, uh, you know, after my eight-year cake, um, last year, a friend asked me, so Connie, what was the big lesson this year? And I said, I learned how to close the door. <laughs> and, you know, it just, it sounds simpler. But I got to tell you, the lessons are harder. That's hard to do. You know, it was easy. Don't drink, go to meetings. Now you got to close doors. And... <laughs> It's, it's hard. It's not all happy, but it's better than it ever was. I need to talk to you just for a few minutes about my relationship, Brian. He's the guy who's going to come here in, uh, in, uh, drag tonight and, um, I love him lots. And it's, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me and it's growing and you know, it's the first thing I've ever, first time I've ever been into something where it gets better every day. But, you know, you think you're going to get a relationship and you're just going to in AA and you're just going to sit around and read the big book together. And, <laughs> and that doesn't happen. But, um, you know, I met him in AA and he'd been a friend and I kept telling my sponsor, I'm just dating him, I'm not sleeping with him, this one's different, oh, I'm being so good. And we went to San Francisco for a weekend and we were up on this Chinese restaurant up at the top, one way over, over the edge or down an elevator, and he said, and we drank together for 15 years, and he said to me, do you remember the night about eight years ago when you dragged me home? And another blackout, I didn't remember, and uh, he had the room right, though, and the teddy bear right, and so I have to believe him, and I thought, wow, you know, so here all this time I was trying to be good, and it was too late. <laughs> but it's but it's not all perfect, you know, and, and but we have a good one today because we try real hard, you know, to keep the program in our home and, and I love it. And you know, he got me a he he spoiled me and and he bought me a Honda. And he said to me it's a couple years ago now, but he's not that long. And he said to me, do you want a standard or do you want an automatic? And I said, oh, I don't care. So he had the nerve to buy a standard. I didn't know how to drive it. <laughs> it was a, a, a five-speed, and it was a spiffy little car. And and so we'd go out for driving lessons on this country road, and we'd get going down the road. and. And um, I would jerk and bump along, and, and I'd tell him, the clutch is broken. And he'd say, <laughs> it's not broken. I'd say, it is. And he'd say, well, no, it's not. And i just get out. And so he'd have no choice but get in, because I'd just leave the car in the middle of the road. And he'd drive it a little bit down the road. And 
And he'd say, the clutch is not broken. I'd say, okay, change back in the other side. And I'd get bumping and grinding down the road. And I would say, yeah, the clutch is broken. And he'd say, <laughs> and look at it, you know. And so he'd, and I'd just get out. So he had to get in. And we changed places again. And I knew what the problem was. You see, Honda had sold us a bad car. And, <laughs> and you know, that's, that's like six years, seven years sober. I had to hang it on somebody because I was frustrated because I was a ha- having a hard time learning. And I'm happy to report I know how to drive a standard now. And, you know, um, I heard an old timer say once that every night, he has 12 kids in a wonderful marriage, long time marriage, and he says every night without fail, he says to his wife, I love you, and if I hurt you at any time today, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. I thought, wow. <laughs> but every night, you know, every single night, I say to him, I love you. And he says, well, you should. I say, well, I do, and then I crack up, and uh, I'm really, really happy to have, you know, have a relationship with somebody in this program. It can work if you let it. Hands off. We even belong to the same home group, but all the other meetings we pretty well go to alone. We kind of like that idea of going out on a Saturday night right now and keeping it family, but we certainly, most certainly, go to our own meetings, and... uh you know, last July, uh, I got a job, and it was, it, no, I'd had other jobs, honest. I was a janitor at a hospital for five years, and I had arthritis, and I had to quit. And I've been going to school for five and a half years, part-time. And last July, I got a job in my field, in the human resource field. But before I got the job, I had to have a background check. And because I had to have a background check, I had to tell them all about my background and that I was in AA. Well, I still had to get the paper checked at the RCMP, so down I went to the RCMP. It was a big year for me last year. And, uh, you know, there was a fellow in front of me, and then the officer said, well, it's your turn, and he took my paper, and he went in the back room, and he started running me through the one computer, the local one, and you know those printers always sound like they're printing way more than they are, and I just... <laughs> and then he started running me through the CPIC computer, which is the, you know, Canadian-wide one, and... Uh, back it came it was rocking and rolling in there and he came back out and he said to me you don't remember me do you and I said no and he said I'm Corporal Thompson I'm the one you put in the hospital 10 years ago and he took me down to this room where he fingerprinted me it was necessary for the background check and uh, and he shut the doors and he told me that his mother and his sister had died of alcoholism. And he asked me why I didn't think people stayed in AA. And when I walked out of there, I knew what you told me, what you meant about amends. You told me that a man wasn't saying, I'm sorry. That's all you ever did when you were drinking, Connie. Amend means you change. And when you've made that change, the amend will be made. And when I came out of there, I understood about the freedom from amends. And not once did I say, I'm sorry. Not once. And I know that amend is made. Well, what a wonderful fellowship. There's only two conditions here. Don't drink, work with other people. Where else can you go for a deal like this? I've never had two days the same in AA. I didn't know such great people came to AA. I thought... It was for losers and for weak people who couldn't handle their own lives. I didn't know it was hard for everyone. And yet somehow if I just hang around here, my life keeps changing for the better. And you taught me that there was always something wrong with me. And I was messed up longer than I've been drinking. But to take it really easy because I damn near killed myself taking it hard. And you taught me that A's for people with guts 
and for people with no guts and uh, people with no guts and people with guts that don't even know they have it have them and he told me that God will restore you to sanity Connie Connie, but the stupidity you'll have to handle yourself and that's happened that's happened (laughs) and uh, you told me that out there you have to see it to believe it but in here you got to believe it to see it and he told me really simple things like if you're doing something wrong find out what it is and don't do that anymore <laughs> and, and he told me and he taught me that rigorous honesty has really not a whole lot to do with what I tell you but it has a whole bunch to do with what I tell myself and he taught me that I'm here as a result of my disease and not because of my defects and that for sure God answered somebody's prayers that's why I'm here but they just weren't mine and uh, the woman in my fifth step will drink again but I won't if I continue and that an alcoholic doesn't need a drink until she takes one and I was an alcoholic when I got up this morning and I'll still be one when I go to bed and you allowed me the most profound experience of my life although this one's getting pretty close you allowed me to go to Seattle and hold hands with 48,000 other alcoholics and say the serenity prayer. And when you hold hands with 48,000 other alcoholics and say the serenity prayer, you will know the meaning of the serenity prayer. And uh, an unspoken promise for me, my outsides are starting to match my insides now. This is my tenth time I've worn a dress. so touched you know I went to the long timers meeting today and I just have to say this I know we have to close I went to the long timers meeting today and what a hoot those ladies were it was just so great and they were all in 30 or 40 years sobriety they were just a riot and I am so touched that I got to Alcoholics Anonymous while the first generation of Alcoholics Anonymous is still alive (laughs) Some of them are dead now, and and if we go by God's chronological plan, the rest won't be here all that much longer, and I got lucky. You know that people that come in five and ten years from now won't have even gotten to meet those people, and I've gotten to watch how they live, and I have a whole bunch of them out in White Rock. George S. just took a 48-year cake, and Newton Bill, and, and George didn't even get sober the first time around, and 48 years, and, and Newton Bill in his 40s, and Gordy M. in his 40s, and Dorothy Cheese taking a 45-year cake next week. I mean, it's just amazing. I'm so lucky, and they all have the same answer. They're all in the book. Their answers don't change. They all have the same one. They have this way of keeping it so damn simple it drives me crazy. (laughs) Eugene O'Neill, he's an author who wrote The Great God Brown, once wrote, Man is Broken, and he lives by mending, and God's grace is the glue. And if we took all our pain and suffering and mixed it in a big pot, well, I think that's the glue that holds us together. So I thank God for uh, blue. <laughs> I was a solvent abuser. I'm not anymore. I don't sniff it anymore. And I'd like to close with just a, a short story. Um, it sort of chronicles my sobriety. There was a woman, a mom and a little girl, sitting in a room. And the little girl was just driving her crazy. Give me something to do. Give me something to do. And the mom was going crazy. So finally she got her a puzzle. And she got her a puzzle of the world. And she said, it gave her the puzzle and said, there. And the little girl went off with the puzzle. And the mom thought, that will keep her for a while. It's a hard one. And the little girl was back in ten minutes. And the puzzle was all together. And the mom said, well, how did you get it done so fast? And she said, it was easy, mom. I flipped the pieces over, 
and on the other side was a woman. And when I put the woman together, the world came together. And that's what's happened for me. You put this woman together, and my world has come together, and I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.